of area as far as uh, the Lord. Now in chapter 3, we see that uh, it's still he's still going that way as far as warning, and yet in the same time, we see that he is uh, now uh, bringing us into the hope, the keeping our eyes on the Lord Jesus. And so he says, Beloved, uh, let's put on my glasses here. He says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So let's stir ourselves up. Let's get off of our uh, negative feelings or whatever else and just, okay, Lord, stir me up. Get me, uh, get my mind working again. Get me thinking up upon you. Um, and uh, he says, that you may be mindful of the words which we have spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of, uh, of us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? And so here we see that we are in the age of skepticism and the age of scoffers. Oh, you know, you keep hearing, where is the promise of his coming? And one of the things I see time and time again is people come at 666, and everybody knows, you know, they think that is a curse or whatever. And they laugh about it, and they, uh, you know, uh, as for those holy rollers and all the, all the things we hear there. But he says, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget. Now, that's an interesting term. They willfully forget what God is doing. They don't want to hear it anymore. It's old-fashioned. It's old fogey. It's uh, let's uh, let's don't uh, let's don't talk about this all the time. Too much pressure. I mean, I got other things to do in life, um, and so the whole idea is, you know, notice again that uh, the 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 old ways of the world and the lusts of the flesh and the appetites of life uh, become so strong that we don't want to remember what God says here. Uh, the flesh is always working against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And we see that they're contrary one to another, as Paul tells us. And we see here that uh, that's exactly well, what is happening that Peter brings out in a different way. He says, for this way we'll willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished uh, being flooded with water. So there again, creation and the flood. There's two major events that uh, change the world. Actually, more than that, but uh, you think about creation and then the fall and the flood. And Peter goes back to that. Um, creation, by God, was everything was perfect. Then the fall as a result of man's sin and the curse of sin, and then the, the punishment for that sin and the flood. Those were three uh, major things in the Old Testament that changed human history. If man hadn't sinned, we wouldn't have death. And then as a result of that uh, sin and so forth, we see that uh, God finally uh, brought judgment on the water, uh, world through water. And so we see that, and of course, that was the flood. And um, it's sad to see that... Uh, that promise that God gave us, uh, the rainbow, was uh, the, the, something that God gave us uh, as, a, as a symbol of love and of promise that he would never destroy the world like that again, but also the promise of his grace in our lives and how that, that uh, very image of the rainbow is now taken and been desecrated by the lust of the flesh and by people who pervert it. And so it's uh, interesting in the days in which we live. He says, but, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are re reserved uh, for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, so notice he says, this is what's going to happen. Uh, ungodly men are going to do this. Although he, and so the reserved or um, God's allowing it to happen now. But he says, but beloved. Do not forget. And this is what we see the whole theme of this second of Peter. It's all about is I'm putting you to remembrance, putting you to remembrance. Don't forget. Uh, hang on. Uh, God's in heaven and God's dealing with us. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord 
uh, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And so there, there's two verses here that we need to look at. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So here he is saying, first of all, that uh, the Lord is not slack. Oh, excuse me. He uh, goes back to, he says, uh, that, uh, that a thousand years is one day, and one day is a thousand years. In other words, the Lord is timeless. Now, a lot of people would like to use that verse to say, oh, that means that uh, one day in uh, the day of creation could have been a thousand years or a billion years or whatever else. No, this verse is not talking about creation. It's not talking about that at all. It's talking about the second coming. If you notice what he's saying here, is simply because the Lord has not come now doesn't mean that he won't. Now, how long has it been? It's been two days, two, a thousand years. You know, it's been over 2,000 years now since the Lord promised that he's coming again. But uh, we call it imminent, which means suddenly or any time. It doesn't mean it's going to be right next, but it does mean that at any time the Lord could come. And so he always tells us, in no matter what age, to be looking for him. And so we see that that's the promise of his coming. Now, you look back in the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament saint was always looking for the Messiah. They were looking for him to come. Now, he didn't come for hundreds of years, but he did come. And everyone that were looking for him found him. If you look at the Simeon and Anna and all the, all the uh, people that were looking for the Lord Jesus, even the... Uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch, anyone who was looking for the Lord found him. The, uh, the widows uh, of, um, of, Can of Nain and, uh, all the, uh, and others, that, uh, the Syrophoenician woman. All the, the, if they were looking for him, they found him. And folks, we want to be looking for him. And, and he says, they that seek me shall find me. And so we see that uh, God was... Uh, God deals with us in the area of, hey, listen, simply because I haven't come, uh, as Paul said, he's going to come as you know very quickly, uh, and that uh, with the sound of the trump and so forth, uh, and that uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. That means there's going to be a few that are going to die first, and then the rest of us are going to be caught up together, and that's why I say I want to be part of that rapture generation. The generation that never dies, you know, that'd be great. And so let's pray that, uh, you know, I would love to, for the Lord, even so come Lord Jesus. But if he doesn't come in, uh, if he doesn't come while I'm alive, he's still coming. Now we see all the things that are happening and it's kind of exciting uh, about all the technology that's bringing the, uh, the events together. Uh, we see that uh, no man, there's coming a time when you reject uh, the one world religion and you won't be able to buy or sell. And uh, look at uh, what PayPal did this past week. They put it on. They were going to charge anybody up to $2,500 for disinformation if they put it on there. Well, wait a minute. I don't have a PayPal account, but I don't think I want one now either because they'll have to decide. But then from what I understand, uh, I saw a little bit of blurb later on where they had backed off of that and said, oh, that was just something that somebody put out. Well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, PayPal is one of the ways that you buy or sell. And think about all the, and then I think of a credit card company that uh, uh, there was a man down at the south somewhere, and his, or his wife was anyway, and uh, they found something on the internet that they didn't like about him, so they canceled his card right when his wife was in the middle of a trip. So, you know, the things that they can do today in buying and selling. Now we see the cashless society coming. Uh, right now, our administration is trying to, uh, to do away with cash. Uh, is one is very difficult to to use cash today. Then uh, you go to Aldi's. Now Aldi's uh, here recently has loosened up a little bit, and you can use your cash again without having to give you know whatever. But uh, there for a while it was just credit card because they didn't have enough coins and so forth. So it's interesting how that uh, uh, that's all work. The technology is there, but uh, that doesn't mean the Lord's going to come tomorrow. It, the technology is there now for him to do whatever he wants to do. I remember uh, back uh, years ago, I would see those pictures of um, 
of 666, and they would have the ink blotter, you know, the stamp, and the guy would, you know, stamp it on somebody's head or whatever. Uh, that was old technology. Um, now, it doesn't you know, have to be shown. I mean, they could just put it under your skin or whatever. So we see that uh, those are things that they can do. So we see that he says, but do not forget this one thing that the, that the, uh, the Lord, with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. So don't rush the Lord. Don't think that he's got to come in our lifetime. He can. In fact, I hope he does. Uh, if he doesn't, then we're in for, I mean, we're getting to a situation where he's got to do something with the mutilation of children and everything else that we're seeing in the name of social justice or whatever else they call it today. I mean, it's sad to see what's going on in the name of science and uh, people that are supposed to be very brilliant are, that, that don't turn out to be such. And so we see that he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some counts, so he's saying, God's not, now, now notice that what he is saying though is that that at some count like, but he is long suffering toward us. Why has the Lord come? It might be because he's wanting to deal with you. It might be because he's wanting to, for you to deal with that one last sinner that goes to heaven. I think of um, sometimes when you read about uh, uh, histories of war or whatever, um, I think of uh, a man who was. Uh, killed by a sniper or killed um, uh, right at Appomattox. And he was supposed to be the last guy that was killed in the uh, Union Army at uh, war, you know. And they really, they wept over it, you know, that well, why does the killing have to keep going? Well, I'd like to, you know, who's the last person who's going to be saved? Who's going to be the last person who goes to heaven, uh, who is called up together with the Lord in the air? And so he says that, um, that uh, he is dealing with people. Uh, sometimes we look at it today, especially when it's very difficult to get people to church. It's very difficult to, uh, uh, to deal with people about their souls because they are so preoccupied with other things and they're skeptics. And there's a thousand voices out there that will disagree with you and uh, all that kind of stuff. So it's very difficult to work through that. But the power of God is still at work in people's lives. And so he says uh, that he's not slack. God is still dealing, and God is still just as powerful today as he was 2,000 years ago. He doesn't work the same way, and he worked in, but it does, but it, uh, when I say, excuse me, he works the same way, but he doesn't work the same way. In other words, how, pe how are people saved? They're still saved by the, the Lord calling them to salvation, calling them to repentance, calling them in, and, in, uh, and calling them to salvation. He still works in all those ways, but uh, he doesn't do it like he did in Peter and Paul's day of with the great miracles or whatever, because now we're at the end of the age, not the beginning of that age. And uh, now he's going to do it again whenever he changes the age, whenever we go into the next age, which will be the tribulation, and we'll see those signs and miracles again. But uh, God right now is working through the Holy Spirit. He's working through the touching the hearts of men and women. Uh, and and uh, I'll be preaching on that this morning. Paul was called to salvation. It didn't, you know, you don't, you, when you were saved, if you, were, if you are saved, it wasn't because you said, you know, I'm going to do God a favor and I'm going to get saved today. No, it was because God was working in your heart. And we'll see even today that uh, the Lord said when Peter, or when Paul, or why are you kicking your against the pricks? I think Paul was pricked in the heart back when he heard Stephen's message. Now, why are you resisting the Holy Spirit? You know, and, and that probably bothered Paul quite a bit. And the, so a lot of times when people are, and I tell, I tell people with their close relatives or whatever, if you're going to pray that God convicts your loved one of sin, then be prepared for them to get pretty nasty. Expect them to get pretty uh, mean uh, because that's just the way people are when they're under conviction is they get under, you know, they become quite uh, agitated until God deals with their lives. And, that's, you know, you see that with Paul, especially 
Uh, he was going to stamp out Christianity until he realized that uh, that God was dealing in his heart. And so, uh, you know, but but the, Jesus found me. Well, Jesus is the one always looking. The, the Lord Jesus is the one that calls us. We sing like that. Jesus calls us. Uh, we sing, um, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. You think about the songs that we sing. They're more of God working in our lives rather than, us doing anything for our salvation. Our, our salvation begins and ends with God. It begins with him dealing in our hearts. It is, it is he that approaches. He's not willing that any should perish. So God does this in people's hearts. And so he is the one, if you under conviction or if you really sense a real desire, there's something empty there, there's, there's a hunger, there's a thirst, there's something, well, that's, God puts that in our hearts. But he does promise, seek and ye shall find. So, Lord, I want to find uh, your will for my life. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why is God waiting? Why is God giving us a chance now to witness one more time or to to be that witness in Belvedere and in Rockford. How does why, you know, that one, that person that God is still dealing with, that person that we're sowing the seed and we're asking God to deal in their hearts, uh, we must ask God to go before us. Uh, there's, a, there's a big, not I don't think it's a controversy, but it's a, a problem that we're having today. Uh, there's the, there is something about marketing Christianity where you, uh, we want to put our best foot forward. We want to learn how to approach people and the the techniques and so forth to do that. We want to be all men. We want to be all things to all men. That by all means we may win some. But in the end, it is the Holy Spirit who has to deal with that heart. So we are the ones who, as attractively and as patiently and as lovingly and kindly as we can, tell someone about the Lord Jesus. But it is the Lord Jesus who has to do the work in the heart of the person. And so uh, how to, what, you know, do, if we go too far one way, we say, well, God, you got to do it all, so I'm not going to do anything. No, that's uh, fatalism. No, God tells us to go. God tells us to, to, um, to be that witness. And so uh, the idea of witness is we got to represent the Lord Jesus. We are ambassadors of Christ, so we want to put our best foot forward and all those things that we say. But on the other side, we can't twist someone's arm. We can't hit them over the, you know, drag them to church or, you know, or whatever else. Although God deals in different ways with different people uh, in, in different times. But uh, overall, it's going to be your decision whether you follow the Lord or not. Now, we can, what our job is to, then is to present the word and pray that uh, God will help us to find avenues of, um, of proclamation. We have the internet, and uh, it comes and goes as far as people watching. Uh, now that uh, the COVID is over, we probably don't have as many people watching. But, uh, you know, there again, there's a hunger. Um, and we praise the Lord for those who do turn in, tune in, and I'm hoping that we have several this morning. But... Um, but, you know, even with this, you know, I pray, you know, Lord, it's not the technique we have or the technology we have. All we can do is get, we, we can sow the seed. But you're the one who has to deal in the hearts. And so we have to ask God to help us in those areas that God will, uh, uh, that God will give us or that his power work, will work through us or that God will have that person ready. I think of the people that I've led to the Lord. It, most of the time, uh, I can't think of anybody right now off the top of my head that I just walked up to and they got saved immediately. No, it took two or three times or it took, or several times, or it took somebody else that had already been dealing with that person or God had been dealing with that. They knew that something was wrong. They, they, God was already working in the heart of that person when we dealt with them. And I see testimonies like that all the time. Uh, um, a person I was reading the other day, just on the edge of suicide, and somebody, but they, and, but they were praying, God, you just don't love me, 
and somebody knocked on the door and shared Jesus Christ with them, and they got saved. You know, so, so obviously, God was working in that person's heart, and the, the right person at the right time came along with the right message and told them about the Lord Jesus. And so we see that it is God who does the work in us. It is God who calls us. It is God who works now. But the church, and as a pastor, uh, Lord, help me uh, prepare my heart, first of all. And then when I open your word, Lord, uh, you know, prepare, prepare my people. Prepare all of us that we're ready to receive it. That we, that we don't make false statements or something that would throw people off as far as the, the central message of salvation and righteousness before God. That uh, we don't get into you know, all kinds of controversial topics that uh, get us totally off the message. Uh, how many angels can stand on the tip of a ballpoint pen? I don't know. But, you know, that is something. Who, who cares? I mean, when I get to heaven, I'll find out, you know. And there again, there, I'm not sure there'll be any ballpoint pens in heaven. But you know, there. Uh, uh, but who cares? Those are. But people get into all kinds of crazy things about uh, other than who Jesus is and what He wants to do in our lives. Uh, we can get off in prophecy. People love to study Israel. And they love to study um, all the things that are going on. But and people will go to prophecy conference. But the one thing about prophecy conferences, you can't preach prophecy without preaching purity. Because God says, Whoso hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So we tell, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man comes. I don't want to hear about all that sin and everything. I just want to hear about what's going to happen next in Russia and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's fine. You go study Nostradamus or whatever else, you know. But... Uh, uh, although I don't think Nostradamus knew much. I, I would go but more with Daniel and John. But, uh, but you, I think you understand what I'm saying. So, uh, uh, but people get off into all kinds of things, and they, uh, but they're willfully ignorant when it comes to really the will of God in their own lives. I think of one man, I won't mention him now, but he wrote a book that uh, became, uh, he sold millions of copies of it about uh, the Lord's coming. But the guy, guy's personal life was a spiritual wreck. And so I'm not saying that people with spiritual wreck doesn't have spiritual insight, but I'm just saying, you know, and not that my life is totally perfect, you know, or whatever, but I'm not saying any. I think you understand. What I'm saying is uh, there's more to prophecy than just that Israel is going to survive and Israel is going to go into the tribulation and, you know, the one world governments and one world religions and all those kind of things. Yeah, that's true. But what about you right now? What about what God is doing in your life? If this is all, we know this is going to happen. We know the Lord Jesus is coming again. That's our hope. But if that's the case, then what should it motivate us to do? Purity of life. He so hath this open and purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Jesus is pure. Uh, that is First John chapter 3, verse 2. So again, we see that uh, Paul talked, or John, of course, was the supreme New Testament prophet, but uh, he starts off with the purity before he gets into Revelation. And so, uh, so we see that, uh, that this is so important. God is, not, uh, God is not slack concerning his promise, uh, but he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance. And we, there again, we have to be careful in the way that we sell Christianity or promote, or I would love to say proclaim, but some people get into the salesmanship of it, although there is a certain element of, of, uh, of salesmanship that we got to have, as we, but that's not what we proclaim. We don't sell. Uh, and so, um, but then again, you got to do it as attractively as possible. That's why Paul said, I am all things to all men, that by all means I may win some. Uh, you win a little child to the Lord a little bit differently than you would win a 70-year-old mil millionaire. I mean, you approach them a little differently. Um, uh, the faith of a child is a lot easier than the, the skepticism of a 70-year-old. So all these things, uh, there's differences. But uh, now we see then that no, he says that one day. Now notice the day in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. 
There's the day of the Lord. Now, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, at beginning, the Jew, uh, the Israelite, looked at it. This was the way, when the day of deliverance. You know, God, the long day, look what God did for us. Look at uh, the day of the Lord with the Egyptians and uh, the, uh, the Red Sea crossing. When God, and all the miracles that God did and that day of the Lord when he destroyed our enemies. But later on, the prophets started preaching to them and saying, hey, listen, the day of the Lord is also can be a day of punishment. If you're not on God's side, look what he did to his enemies. The same thing he did to his enemies, he can do to you. And so the day of the Lord became a day of judgment. And uh, the day of the Lord became a day of, uh, hey, this is when God's going to be judging Israel. And so this day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, I don't want to go through this day of the Lord now. The day of the Lord is more than just 24 hours here. He's talking about shall come as a thief in the night. Now, that's the start of it. But uh, he's talking about what's going to happen on that day of the Lord. And there's two things that happen on this day of the Lord. First of all, we are gonna, the, the church, the people who know the Lord, are going to be taken up to be with him. But then they, the, what's left on the earth is going to be a day of judgment, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of great judgment, all the, the curses, the things that are going to be poured out for seven years upon this earth. It will come. It will start as a thief in the night. It will come when, wow, what happened? Um, I'm hoping it comes today. I mean, I want the Lord to come and take me home um, and they could have my car, they could have my taxes, they can have my IRA, what little bit I got in it. They, they can have it all because I'm with the Lord. But uh, you don't want to be left here on earth during the day of the Lord. Amen? You don't want to be in that day of judgment. And so we see that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Um in which the heavens will pass away with a great uh, noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Now he's talking about all one. What happens in scripture many times, it will give you one big glob of it and then it will separate it and start showing you the parts. Well, here you have the big glob. Now what, what, is, the end, uh, what is the end judgment of the day of the Lord? The Lord is going to destroy this old uh, cursed earth and he's going to uh, rebuild it and recreate it the way he wants it. Now, he says he's going to burn it up with a fervid heat, um, and the elements shall melt. You know, for years, uh, the skeptics in the 1800s and the early 1900s said, that can't happen. You know, elements, uh, matter is eternal from what they used to say. Uh, matter, I mean, you know, those elements, uh, if you ever took chemistry class or whatever, H is... Uh, is hydrogen and O is water and Fe is iron and uh, those are basic elements, isn't it Fe? Whatever, but uh, those are all elements that uh, no matter what you do with them, they're going to come back in a form. Okay, you can turn uh, water into steam and ice and all that, or you can even separate it to hydrogen and oxygen and all that. But you still have the elements. Uh, you know if. Uh, and I don't want to get too deep because I'm not a chemist. And I was in chemistry class at the time that I was taking it was very boring. But, uh, but um, you see that, uh, uh, that, so that that was the idea. It was elements. Matter is eternal. Well, then along came the atom bomb, and all of a sudden the elements melted with a fervent heat. And all of a sudden they had to rethink that statement that uh, – uh, that. You know, that you look at some of the things that happened uh, at Hiroshima where um, uh, those people, those couple of painters on a ladder, and they were looking up and they, they were vaporized. I mean, and they had nothing but a shadow of them on the, the wall and back of them. Um, and they've got, I was talking to a Marine the other day, he says, oh, we well, talk about vaporizing people today. I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, uh, that's not fun. Um, and so... Uh, uh, we see that the elements can melt with a fervent heat. But when God does it, it's going to be a whole lot worse than any, a whole lot different than anything that man can do. And so we see that uh, he says um, that the elements will burn with a melt, uh, fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So God's going to completely 
melt down or destroy this whole creation, and he's going to make it again in his own image, and it's going to be perfect again. It's all corrupted today. How sad. Everything left to itself rots or disintegrates. Uh, but there's coming a time when the, the matter is going to be eternal again because God's going to make it his way without sin. And so, yeah, that's when matter is going to be eternal, eternal. The streets of gold and all the crystal and all the stuff that we hear about in heaven. Uh, the, the heavens and earth. I mean, uh, we hear about stars and novas and supernovas and how they explode and all those things. They all, you know, think the earth is changing and the universe is changing. But there's coming a day when it's going to be made permanent. And that's, uh, that's mind-boggling because you look at the stars today and you see how that God made everything and you say, I, I, I can't even wrap my mind around the, the hugeness of God, the, the breadth of God, the knowledge of God, the, the power of God. Uh, all we see is just a little bit of it. But uh, can you imagine the God who created, he created us out of nothing? Just amazing. That means that he didn't need any elements to create men. He didn't need any. Now, of course, he did have the elements, and he made man out of dust of the earth. But those elements were created out of nothing before he made men. So there was a chain reaction there. But uh, you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I hope. <laughs> but, uh, uh, because man was made from the elements. He was made from the dust of the ground. But, uh, but those elements were made out of nothing. That, uh, I don't understand that. I, it, it, like I said, you can't wrap your mind around God. The moment you think you could understand God or that you've got a grasp of just who he is, then you've made him down into your image. And none of us, uh, collectively here, none of us have the mind of God or the power of his mind. I mean, if we could, I mean, uh, oh, the depth of both of the wisdom and knowledge of God and his ways past finding out. There's no way. If, uh, if we could figure out God, we wouldn't need him. But uh, if, we need, if we could figure out God, he wouldn't be very big. <laughs> Just think about it. But he is someone that we c must respond to. And so we see that uh, he says, therefore, uh, he says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? There again, it comes back to purity. If this is going to happen, and if prophecy is going to be fulfilled, then what about you? And what manner of person are you? What should that do in your life? It calls you to holiness. It calls you to, to live for the Lord. He says, um, in the holy uh, conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening to the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, this old world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. And this old world's not going to be hang, hanging around very long either. But there's coming a new heaven and a new earth. And God's going to make it. Do you really believe that? I do. But I don't understand it. You know, I, can't, you know, I can't wrap my mind around it. But, hey, that's what. That's hope of the believer. That's, things are going to get better. That's why I like to say, if you're a Christian, cheer up. No matter how bad things get on earth, things are going to get better. If you're not a Christian... You better enjoy it while you can. Amen. Okay, so here we see the, uh, the, 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 well, what have you done with Christ? With him is hope. Without him is, you're just, you're a part of his creation, but you're going to be a victim of his creation too, rather than a, uh, the, rather than a, a blessing in it. And so, uh, the, verse 14, therefore, Beloved, and we'll finish up, I hope. Okay, so notice he says, therefore, beloved. So, hey, fellas, hey, people, let's listen. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. There it is, the hope of the believer. We just had the Hope uh, for America conference. With Christ, there's, of course, there's, there's three elements of our faith. 
of our, of our relationship with the Lord. It's our faith in him. We put our faith in him as for our salvation, for our being, for our welfare, for everything about our lives. Then we put our hope in him. That's what we expect him to do something. We expect his uh, will. We expect him to talk with us and walk with us. We expect him to do the work. We expect to go to heaven. I'm expecting to go to heaven, not because I deserve it. And I'm not just hope, hope, hope. No, I'm expecting to go to heaven because God, standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages, let his praises ring. And so I want to, to I, I, I expect to go to heaven. He says, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. John did in 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John 5. But here we see that uh, he says, you can know that. Then if I can know it, then can I not expect it? Then I could also know that I could expect him to deal with my heart. I could expect him to comfort me. I could expect him to answer prayer. I could expect him uh, to convict me. Boy, have I been under conviction lately. Sometimes, sometimes God works on each one of us in different areas of our lives. And so we see that uh, I can expect because uh, I can expect him because it's like my wife. She should be able to expect me whenever I uh, uh, go to work or whatever that she should expect me to be coming home, right? With all kind of goodies, no, but <laughs> but but uh, no, uh, but that's you know when you have a relationship, you expect certain things out of people, right? I mean, if we ask people, if you're going to join the church here, then can we not expect now? I like, you know, the idea, well, I want to have all the blessings you've got, and I want to be saved, but Lord, don't expect anything from me. Well, wait a minute. Whosoever, you know, hath this hope in him, God should be able to expect something out of us. Not pure, not our purity, but a desire for purity, a hunger for it, a desire for him. And, of course, as a result, a, um, an orientation of our life toward him. And so we see that he says, um, uh, and consider the long-suffering of our Lord uh, is, uh, is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul. I like that. Paul and Peter worked together, although they had some disagreements. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul said that, boy, we, we really had some, we had to sit down and talk about some things. He says, according to the wisdom given to him, as he has written also in his epistles. So notice now Peter is toward the end of his life and he is recognizing that God is using Paul in the epistles that he's writing. He says, and also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are uh, some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. So even in Paul's day and even in Peter's day, there are people that are going to twist the Scriptures. That is why it is incumbent upon me as a pastor, as a teacher, to find out what God says and not myself. To give the overall what God wants in our lives and not my own opinions. And whenever it is my opinion, I let people I let people know there's several things in Scripture where, you know, we we don't have we have principles we don't but we don't have rules. So what is modesty? What is, uh, you know, what what is uh, pure living? You know, should you have a television in your house? You know, th those type things. Uh, those are all things that uh, that we it's hard to make rules about. You know, back when I was growing up, uh, it was a sin to go to movies. But now you could, you could, uh, what you, Netflix, you could bring movies into your house, you know. So all kinds of things we have to be careful about as far as what is sin and what is, you know, things that, uh, uh, and there again, there are, you, you don't want to be tied up in movies. <laughs> you know, there's a principle there that uh, about righteous living. Uh, that uh, we want to admonish our people to do. But he says uh, that, uh, he says they're, they're going to twist Scripture. People are going to twist Scripture. That's the reason it's important for us to, but to make the message clear and plain. 
make it clear, clear, clear and plain. Make sure that we stay, uh, that we, um, that we major on the majors. I guess is what someone said. So then we finish up. He says, "You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand." So there again, he's reminded. Remember this: remind, remind, remind. All this. I'm telling you things. I'm repeat, repeat, line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But so first of all, uh, that says beware. Don't let this draw you. These things draw you away. But keep your eyes. Notice he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So there it is. Major on the majors. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Don't get drawn away with the lusts of the flesh and the arguments of the world and all the rest. Uh, keep your mind on who Jesus is. Christianity is a relationship. It's not a religion. It's not a, a rule book. It's a relationship with a person. And we can expect something from him. But he should be able to expect something from us. And so we see that he says, but grow in the grace. And, and relationships have to grow. Uh, they just they don't stay static. Uh, my wife and I, uh, our relationship now is better than it was 20 years ago, I hope. I mean, I think it is. I'm, I'm, it is with me. I'm sure it is with her. But, you know, there again. But we've developed over the years. We've, you know, there are certain things that we don't even have to expect any because we just know they're going to do them. I just know she's going to be a certain way and that, she's, that she loves me, you know. And, and I can expect certain things from her. But then she can expect certain things from me without even having to talk about it because it just comes natural. Well, that's the way relationships are. There, aren't there certain things about Christ that uh, should just come natural to us? I mean, the Lord should expect us to be faithful. Now, do, are we sinful? Oh, my. Yes. Are there the times we have to go to the Lord and ask forgiveness? The, the rough things about having to do it over and over again for the same thing. And that's a rough one, isn't it? But there again, it's a relationship. And so, of course, the whole reason he sums it up, to him be glory both now and forever. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's been a great study. I hope that uh, it's been good for you as far as going in uh, the whole, the key word in the book of Second Peter, the second epistle, is remember. Remember where you were. Remember what God did for you. Remember what God is doing for you. Remember who he is. And remember your obligation to him your relationship with him. Don't make it into an, uh, I, maybe I used the wrong word, don't make it into something I got to do. Make it into something you want to do because you love him. You know, I got to go home and be with my wife. You know, she's just, uh, you know, around 40 years, 42 years, and then just have to, time after time, we just, uh, <laughs> I don't want a marriage like that. I want to go home to be with my wife. She's a good lady to be around. Yeah, I, I I miss her when she's not here, or not with me, whatever. Why? Because there's a relationship. In the same way with the Lord, I, I gotta go, and I got to, you know. No, wait a minute. I should want to be with my Lord, should I not? It's a relationship. And so, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, uh, change us. We realize, Lord, just how weak. And how needy we are. We realize, Lord, just uh, how much we must hunger for you in this old world where the hungers of the old flesh can overtake us. And so, Father, we pray that uh, you would keep us looking toward you and for you. Lord, give us that hunger for purity. Give us that hunger for righteousness in our lives. Uh, for power, Lord, that you would work through us in touching other people's lives. Give us the hunger for souls. We want others to have what we have in you. Lord, we pray for our people. Lord, uh, our people are needy, and we hunger to see you work in their lives and meet their needs and answer their prayers and, and heal their health and all the rest, Lord. We know we can trust you. So, Lord, 
Glorify yourself through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.